We are live. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Richard Kubek. I'm privileged to be the chair of Abraham's Table of Long Island. I want to welcome you to the 36th Abraham's Table uh, Interfaith Program. Uh, this is our fifth anniversary. We began five years ago on December 5th of 2015. Uh, bringing together Jews, Christians, and Muslims in dialogue, uh, celebrating and understanding uh, what we have in, in common as the three great Abrahamic religions. So tonight's panel, What Draws You to Your Faith, it's probably the most introspective of our 36 programs. We're going to go deep into who we are and what we believe. And um, the program, frankly, is quite timely because the latest public opinion polls are showing that 25% quarter of all Americans now say they belong to no religious affiliation. Um, they're called nuns, which is ironic because my religious affiliation came from nine years of the other kind of nuns, a great <laughs> through eight. Um, and uh, those of us who remain active, um, we're doing so at much lower levels than uh, that we once did. I remember as a kid, Catholic kid in the 1950s and 60s, mass was jammed, not so much anymore. Um, Again, a public opinion poll showed that only 38% of Catholics go to mass on a weekly basis. And that's kind of high compared to some of the other uh, denominations. So for those of us who identify as Jews or Muslims or Christians in this secular society, what is it that draws us to this faith of ours? So I'm sitting in front of my family Christmas tree. It's disappeared. Maybe if you could take off the uh, screen share for a second, please. So I can come back, there I am. So there's my Christmas tree. Um, it's probably the, one of the central symbols of uh, the Christmas holiday. Um, and uh, when you look at it, um, it has very little to do with Christmas and the birth of Christ. There's an angel here and there that you might be able to see, but, but there's all kinds of snowflakes and Santas and, and, and yet it wouldn't be Christmas without that symbol behind me. So it raises some questions of why do I go through that trouble? And we all do it. If, you put up a tree, it's a pain in the neck. Uh, and, and if it really isn't related to Christianity and to the birth of Jesus, what is it? Um, and, and that's really the question tonight for all of us, for our panelists and for our audience, what draws us to our faith? So I'm gonna tell a story and uh, I want you as I'm presenting this to think of one of the worst dining experiences you ever had. Uh, this was mine, one of the worst. So <laughs> we went to dinner my wife and I with two other couples, my wife and I are Catholic and, and the two uh, other couples were Jewish. And I think it was near one of the big holidays. It may have been Passover. We're in a restaurant. And uh, one of the, uh, Jewish, the Jewish women were talking about how they celebrate. So the one woman was describing the food that she cooks and that they say prayers and um, uh, how she sets the table and various traditions. <clears throat> and the other woman said, well, do you go to synagogue? And she said, the first woman said, not really. Frankly, I'm an atheist. Um, and I do these things to remain connected to my faith. And the second woman said, well, then you can't be Jewish if you don't believe in God. Uh, I don't have to tell you the rest of the dinner was a nightmare. Um, but it raises some tough questions for all of us. I mean, why do we do this? Why do we come back? year after year, week after week in some cases. Um, and, 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 um, and, you know, if we surround ourselves with things like a Christmas tree that are meaningless, then what is it of meaning to us? So, so we did a survey, and now I'm gonna ask uh, if you could put that survey up. Um, we asked up our, our uh, supporters, we had about 350, we had a 13% response, and we gave them a, a bunch of factors you know, how do you rate this from one not important to two somewhat important to three very important? And uh, this is what they told us. If you can make that a little larger, that would be great. If not, I'm gonna, there you go. Perfect, thank you, Mehmet. It's our technician, Mehmet. So, so here's a summary of what they told us. So our, our respondents said they overwhelmingly value growing closer to God. Uh, and, um, and this was really interesting, but they do not, strongly believe in a God who interferes in human affairs or protects them from adversity. Um, so they believe in God, but not one they can turn to for help. And yet, um, 
they strongly believe in uh, thanking God for support. So we'll be talking about that because tonight, because that raises some questions that if they don't believe in a God who intervenes in human affairs, then of what are they thanking God? Or for what are they thanking God? Um, this was interesting. They, they uh, did not strongly believe in a judgmental God. Um, they did not strongly believe in a God who offers salvation or eternal life. Uh, and they did, this was, this really surprised me. They did not strongly believe in a God who offers forgiveness for transgressions. So um, they did value scripture and moral and ethical teachings of their faith. They did not value religious dogma and doctrine. And they were really divided. This surprised me too. <clears throat> they were very divided on the value of liturgy, religion, uh, in, in, in uh, liturgy and uh, music and art. Um, so when asked, for example, 39% uh, said these things were not important. Uh, about 33% said somewhat important and about 24, the smallest number said very important. That surprised me. Um, this was overwhelming. They, Draw, very clearly drawn to their faith for transcendence, to be part of something greater than themselves, to have some sense of purpose and meaning at different stages in their lives. And, and when asked about, you know, how would you live the transcendence, these are what in the order of importance, very important, helping vulnerable people, working for justice and peace, connecting with their family histories, and uh, relating to the stories and the history of their religion. And then on a personal note, they, they said they were drawn for these satisfactions to, to get a sense of internal peace and solace, um, to socially interact with other people like themselves of their own faith, to honor traditions and holidays like my silly Christmas tree, uh, and to um, have a sense of self-discipline and social order um, that they feel the faith provides them. So this is what our, survey respondents told us. And now if we can go to our panelists, um, purpose for tonight is to hear from folks who are for the most part on our planning committee. So normally we have rabbis and ministers and priests and imams, but welcome to our planning committee. Here they are in person. These are the folks, some of the folks who, uh, who bring you Abraham's table, not all, but some of them. So uh, I'm going to just introduce each one, and he or she will tell you their affiliation, and then we'll get into the program. So, Batsheva. Batsheva Slavin. I represent the Suffolk Y. I'm a member of Temple Bet Shalom in Roslyn, and okay. I teach the community. Thank you. We always go, by the way, if, if you are uh, regulars to Abraham's table, we always go historically. So we begin with the oldest religion, the Jewish religion. So, David, number two. Hello, everyone. I'm David Pinkowitz. Uh, I'm a member of Temple Beth Torah in Melville and the Jewish Community Relations Council of Long Island. Okay. And then we have Father Bill Brissetti. Uh, I'm a retired priest from the Diocese of Rockville Center, uh, from the, the parish of Our Lady of the Miraculous Medal in Wyandanch, uh, currently assisting in Wyandanch and also in Riverhead. You're up. Pastor Emeritus, that's my parish. Pastor Emeritus, uh, yes. Right. De Deacon Jean Doherty. I'm Deacon Jean Doherty, and I'm from St. Andrew's <coughs> Lutheran Church in Smithtown and serve at Abiding Presence Lutheran Church in Fort Salonga. Thank you. And Sadri Altanak. Uh, Sadri Altanak, uh, I am the president of Church Council Center in New York, and I help out with uh, many other organizations. And our last speaker, another from the Muslim community, Taha Birman. Oh, sorry. Hey, I'm Taha. I'm uh, also from the Turkish Cultural Center, and uh, I'm there as a mentor for the students. Thank you. So welcome to our panelists, who I know very well because we meet monthly to plan these events. So welcome back, I should say. Uh, for those of you watching at home, you can participate. Uh, some of you already did, and I want to thank those of you there were, I think, 47 folks who responded to the questionnaire. Um, and I want to thank you for that. That's a form of participation. Uh, and, and for those of you who want to ask questions tonight, in the lower right-hand corner, you will see a chat box. All you have to do is type in your question, and they'll be, we'll try to get to as many as we can. So questions or comments. So um, here's what we've agreed to do. Each of the panelists is going to uh, speak about one of the factors that were, was in our survey. 
And um, so I will introduce each panelist and then we'll have a chance to, uh, to, for everybody to respond. So Batsheva is gonna talk about the importance of art, religious art, and what draws her to her Jewish faith <clears throat> in the form of art. Shalom, good evening, everyone. Uh, uniquely to my panel uh, partners, I myself was not just born into my Jewish faith. I was born in it. I was born in the land, in the Holy Land, where I was surrounded by the beautiful nature and the beautiful Jewish life that was right around me. Uh, I was born at the time that the new state of Israel was established. I was born in 49. The state was established in 48. And I grew up together with all the gatherings that came into the land. People from all over the world, from the diaspora came back to Israel. And with them came all the arts from around the world. As a young woman, I was always thinking about the second commandment. And why the second commandment? We were told not to create an image, not to copy the image of God, as it is said, you shall not have no other gods besides me. You shall not make for yourself a sculpture or an image or any likeness to the world above in the heavens or the world on earth or below the waters. And there, there was so many artistic interpretation of our Jewish life that bewildered me. Even my great grandfather who came from Russia was carving beautiful tombstones and preparing tombstones for people who were passing away. So where did the art come in? I understood that we are commanded not to do it. But then when you think of the beautiful stories of the Torah, the creation of the world, Noah's Ark with all the colorful explanation and description and the tabernacle in the desert, the different implements that were created. I don't know if you can see some of it. Mm -hmm. This is a plate. Where did it come about? There was this gentleman, the first Jewish artist, as we can call him, and he was called Betzalel, in the, the, literally meaning in the shadow of God. So if we all live in the shadow of God and we are all commended to follow, then follow like Bezalel, make an impression of the world and make it better. He made all the implements directly with the direction of God. So to me, nature surrounding me, all the different people that came from Yemen and Persia, from Poland. Here, here for instance, I have a scroll This scroll is about 600 years old. You can see the beautiful Persian artwork. We were allowed to make our commandments beautiful. beautiful. We were allowed to beautify the commandments. Even in the 12th century, where we were told not to make images in our scriptures, the famous Agadot, where the drawings were uh, creative of people leaving Egypt with the heads of birds, called the birds Haggadah, the bird stories. We were from one side wanting to be intertwined to, with the contemporary of the world, the world of the world, uh, on the other side, trying to keep our commandments. To me, the beauty of our tradition lies with the way we can make everything more beautiful and actually bring nature into our life. As a museum curator in Temple Bet Shalom in Roslyn, I have the honor and the pleasure to hold this object, whether it's a contemporary piece of art that imitates the past or, a, or an old art that speaks about the present. This is what keeps me close to the tradition. There are many, many other ways I stay close to our tradition, 
but my faith lies with nature and the beauty of nature that surrounds us. Thank Good, you. thank you, Bacheva. So um, we have at various times uh, been able to visit each other. The, our committee has gone to the services of the other, other denominations and um, I noticed, you can't help but not notice, but there are no images of people uh, in either the Muslim or the Jewish traditions. Uh, and there was an interesting point in Christian tradition when the iconoclasts wanted to remove images of people, but they failed. So let's get some opinions from anybody on the panel of, of what Bathsheba just said about the importance of art. Where are you on that? So I just yeah. wanted to show that uh, right in my office, always in, within my view, is a beautiful uh, Hamsa statue that I bought in Jerusalem. And uh, I agree with the concept. Art can be very holy and, uh, and very, very, very gratifying. Okay. I want to say below my Christmas tree, there is a beautiful Italian nativity scene, which is religious, which is the scene of the, the birth of Jesus. And it's very, very precious to our family. I just Above want it, to add. <laughs> snowflakes, snowflakes and Santas, but we do have that down there. Uh, Father Bill, go ahead. Uh, you know, art is important in the Christian tradition. Uh, <clears throat> and I, I think the most significant thing is, as we see you know, around the world, you know, the different depictions of things, you know, I mean, as, as Christians, you know, the, Mary, the mother of Jesus, as she looks differently, today is, is also the, the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe. So the, the indigenous depiction, the depiction of, of Mary, Miriam, as an indigenous woman, you know, in Mexico, and that was and part of the, the new, uh, you could call it an affirmation, you know, of, uh, of, of, of God's acceptance of, of you know, of, of, you know, some were, were questioning, you know, things like the, uh, the full humanity, you know, from the European perspective, are the people in the indigenous populations really fully human? And, and we're the ones who decide that, you know? So uh, God had a message, I think, in, uh, in the, uh, the creation of the image of, of Our Lady of Guadalupe. You know, mm -hmm. so and I, and I think this is there, there are many other my, my work in Latin America and, uh, you know, in, in the Andes or in Central America. And, and there are, are different things that uh, that really show the 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 depth of God's presence to people in primitive circumstances uh, and how it's, it's expressed in their art and it can teach us something about those people. Anybody else? So I'm going to jump around because, because this was part of the category that surprised me, uh, liturgy, that um, liturgy and art were not terribly important. Again, something like 39% said unimportant, uh, and 33 or so percent said somewhat, and 24% not important at all. So I'm going to jump to Deacon Gene, if you could, you were going to talk about liturgy. Am I right on that, or did I get there? No, I'm sorry. But Bill, spill. Sorry about that. Father Bill, on literature. Me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I guess uh, choose, choose me and with liturgy, and I guess in the sense of that's my thing, you know, <laughs> the liturgy. But I, <laughs> I'd like to maybe just, you know, I hope I'm not going to speak in ways that are, uh, are too, you know, esoteric. Uh, but, uh, you know, I was drawn to my faith by, by, we all, I think, have been through people, people who, that they were, faith made sense. But I was drawn to my faith and, and ultimately to my vocation by people who, who truly understood uh, and lived liturgy, who saw it not just as, you know, a nice thing as part of a life of faith, but rather as, as an integral part of lives of faith and of service and transformation, you know, transformation of themselves and helping to transform society in the image of God. You know, the ultimate call of all of us and, you know, Jewish, Christian, Muslim, or whatever uh, faith is to be a, a, you know, an integral human being. <laughs> 
as as we learn from you know in, in our in our Bible the image and likeness of God. How can you improve on that? The liturgy helps us connect. It's an integral part of lives of faith, service, and transformation. I'm struck by the seeming lack of importance uh, in mm-hmm. the survey, but it's sadly not really surprised by it. Uh, and we could discuss the reasons. Liturgy as a word means the work of the people. It's from the Greek, the work of the people. And for Christians, liturgy is the summit and the source of all that we are and do. And for our own, you know, the the Christian liturgies in the course of a three year cycle, we read and reflect on virtually the entire Bible as that it may become part of the rhythm of our lives. the importance of, a, of consistent rhythms through cycles and seasons. As we grow old, listening to these stories and, and learning to reflect on connections with, our, with the realities of our own lives and of the world, a gradual patterning of our conduct throughout our lives, and ever deeper into the meaning that God shares in the sacred scriptures, and for Christians into, the, into Christ's moment at the Last Supper, with his disciples, uh, the washing of the feet, the sharing of the, of the bread and the cup. And, and our connection in all of this and facing today's challenges. But, but again, it, it helps us to, to gradually deepen in, 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 in our relationship with God and then ultimately in solidarity with one another. Uh, the stories of our family and faith ancestors at heart and always the project of God uh, that, that, uh, that is represented in the liturgy, the project of God in and through creation, then now always ever the same, yet it's always new. There are two Greek words, each translated as time. Kairos, eternal now in God, and the, the coming to feel God and God's presence in the, in the meaning of each moment and each experience. And chronos, the moment to moment chronology of time as we live it, days, weeks, months, years, decades, centuries. We need both dimensions, both perceptions of time for a full appreciation and a fully human life. And faith should help us along this. And as people of faith, we need to understand liturgy as doing that for us. It connects us with creation, with the earth, with history, with eternity. Uh, and I just think of, you know, I saw a movie recently about a tree. And they, you know, embrace a tree, touch a tree, and feel the, the link to the earth and to history. And, and, and it, it also contains its source of things that fall from it and become new trees that go on ultimately throughout all the history of the earth to feel transcendence and more, more ourselves right there and then. And then when I heard the, the word transcendence before, the people feel transcendence, but transcendence also needs focus. It needs to be applied moment to moment. And so the liturgy helps us in both those dimensions. And this is only a brief comment. So I, just to close, I say we need the liturgy uh, because it helps us uh, by, by then living in the stories of our faith ancestors over and over through our lives. And as for Christians, the bread, the cup, the service, communion, our real connection, a profound link to this eternal Kairos moment of God. And for Christians with, with and in Jesus and all of our predecessors in faith who have woven God's meaning as they've learned it into the fabric of their own chronology on this planet, as we try to do and inspire folks like us to join with others on a Sunday afternoon, where you could be doing lots of, we watching a football game. <laughs> you know, I'm sure there is one, uh, but who struggle in that process today. So I, th- I think the liturgy is for me, all of that and so much more. Wow. So that you really uh, drill deep down into the, meaning and the purpose and the essence of liturgy. Um, I personally uh, miss it for the artist, I mean, for all you said, but I, I find the artistic, the, the music and the, the vestments and the, um, 
pictures and the statues, very powerful, and, and, and the, the artistic components. And when we went around to visit uh, one another's um, services, um, I remember David went back to his rabbi and said, well, down the road at Miraculous Metal, they sing. Why can't we sing more um, and have more hymns? And I remember going to Bat Sheva and saying, I love the way, the beauty of elevating the scripture to the centerpiece of, of it was very simple, um, but, but very powerful. So um, I'm wondering why liturgy and even the artistic components and the deep meanings of, were not more important to our respondents. Any of you want to comment on that or anything that Father Bill said? It really came out rather low on the uh, spectrum. Again, only 24% of the respondents found the liturgy to be, and, and the arts to be very important. Only 24%. Anybody want to go ahead, Dave? No, I'll step back to Jean, who had, had her hand up, but put it down. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see that. Well, go ahead, go ahead, David, you go first. Okay, so, so I have a couple of theories. Uh, the first theory is, I didn't really know what, uh, what liturgy was in the detail that uh, Father Bob explained it. I learned something there, and I, and I think many others might not be so aware of, of these uh, components of liturgy. And the second thing that I would observe is that in, in today's day and age, uh, some of these very idealistic and spiritual things, uh, maybe people don't have time for them. They're so distracted with their daily lives. Okay. Jean? For me, I'd say... Uh, I, put, I think I put liturgy on the survey as my number one because, you know, as Father Bill was alluding to, it's when you're a consistent worshiper, um, it's a breathing out, a breathing in and a breathing out of, of liturgy. So, it, so I think for folks that um, feel disconnected from liturgy, maybe that's not part of um, their yearly you know, practice. And for me, it's the symbolism that we're, you know, we're lighting candles and we're, we're singing and just the, the large symbols tell us what our faith is. And then it's the communal gathering of everyone within the liturgy. So um, I think that that's part of it is when it's something you're doing regularly, it becomes just like, like breathing for you. By the way, I remember our previous pastor went to uh, preach at St. Paul's Lutheran in um, Northport. And uh, the next Sunday, he said, my God, the Lutherans can really sing, not like us. <laughs> they really get into the music. <laughs> We're singers, that's for sure. Yeah. Any, any sense of why it wasn't important? Anybody want to comment on that? Dave said maybe people are just too busy, but... Um... I, I think people... It's Bacheva. I think yeah. people have objects and listen to the music, at least in, in our Jewish faith, and know the process that we have a reading process of the scriptures, beginning with the first book of Moses, all the way through the five books, that we have cycles. I think people are aware of it, but it's not the central part of the daily exchange. Okay. So, uh, so the Put it the last. They want God to help them if they're sick. They want God to help them to have a good, successful year in the business. But they leave the rest of the stories in temple. Okay. And maybe I would like to add on to this. Uh, you know, I think the the everything is too fast today. I think, you know, I think the, the maybe the, it's the way liturgies are done in, in various places. Um, you know, we're all imperfect. <laughs> uh, you know, I think that, uh, you know, the, the people is, you, you want, it's like the practical, you know, it's, 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 it's wasting time. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, you know, reading poetry, <laughs> you know, is is a is a things like that are it takes time. And I think that the liturgy is is a, there's a moment. It's a discipline, but it also it it, it we we've got to help people to understand and see the connections related to the transcend. I'm, I like those that the word transcendent. People are interested in that, but they really don't understand what transcendence is, and that transcendence 
is 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 part of the depth of, of, of the moment of now and the way we live uh, and as effective human beings in family and, and in, in politics and society uh, and in business or whatever, or whatever we dedicate our lives to, that the liturgy has got to be more seen into, into uh, as, as part of that, uh, uh, you know, the rhythm, the breathing in, as Gene was talking about, breathing in and out. Uh, and that's our moment of meeting God is in the liturgy, right? Yeah. So, so that's the exciting part. That, yeah, that, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I just want to add that my point of view and David Crowley point of view and the rest of our Jewish friends in Abraham's table is a more uh, reform kind of a point of view. The Orthodox community religiously prays three times a day. They bless their bread and they let bless their meals and they're constantly in conversation with God and they totally worship and read the liturgy every day. So it doesn't reflect of all Jewish traditions. I'm just only one aspect of it. Yeah, and, and I, I, I think uh, all of you understand as our panelists, and I'm sure the audience does, that when I went through the survey results, the people who responded to the survey, and maybe our audience, our Abraham's Table audience, tends to be uh, of a more modern or progressive or open uh, mindset. In fact, the very reality that they come to listen to what the other denominations have to say and think and pray um, suggests that. Um, but um, I have an evangelical uh, nephew, and he would have answered those questions very, very differently, very differently. Um, I just know for me, the liturgy is a moment to get out of myself an hour every week. And I love the art associated. With it. I love the music. Uh, and um, I was telling a colleague of mine, it's the only place probably in my life that I can't get in the door without the opening piece of the liturgy, was, which is think about what I've done wrong in the, for the previous week. There were very few opportunities where anyone would even say that to me. So what did you do wrong today, Kubek? Um, but, but to get into and enter the liturgy, that's, that's the first thing that we do, and it's, it's fabulous. I think um, I want to remind the audience, by the way, you can enter questions or comments into the, um, into the chat, and we'd be happy to hear from you. I think I'm going to jump over to doctrine and scripture. That was another interesting break, and it's kind of related to this. Um, again, uh, yeah, our, our friends who responded said doctrine is not important at all, and scripture, uh, not so much, but more so. Go yeah, ahead, so I was not really surprised that the doctrine, you know, ranked so poorly. I think that uh, yeah. I think that was that was a pretty typical answer, and it put me in mind of a story. So there's a uh, distraught man, and he's he's thinking of throwing himself off a bridge, and another man sees him and he says, "Don't do it. You have so much to live for. You know, do you believe in God?" And he said, "Yes," and he said, "Well, me too. You know." Are you Muslim or, or Jewish or Christian? And he said, I'm, I'm Christian. And he said, well, you know, he said, me too. Are you Protestant or Catholic? And he said, I'm Protestant. And the man said, me too. He said, well, what kind of Protestant are you? And he said, I'm Baptist. And he said, me too. Well, are you Northern Baptist or Southern Baptist? And he said, oh, I'm Northern Baptist. And he said, wow, me too. And well, are you Northern Great Lakes Region Baptist or are you Southern you know, or are you Northern New England Baptist? And he said, well, I'm Northern New England Baptist. And he says, great, me too. But are you a doctrine of 1812 or are you doctrine of 1879? And he said, I'm doctrine of 1879. And the man said, heretic. And he pushed him off the bridge. <laughs> Obviously, it's just a joke, but it's, it's how doctrine, you know, we can have so much in common. And then when we get to doctrine, heretic and push them off the bridge. Um, so that's the one side of the doctrine coin. The other side is, you know, doctrine for, for all faiths tradition, it gives us language to talk about our faith and to interpret our sacred texts. I like to th think of it like eyeglasses. It's, you know, it's how we, how we see things. Uh, but the problem is doctrine also shapes our identity. 
um, and you know we feel very connected to it. It's our traditions that that unify us. So while while the the doctrine and the traditions unify us, they also separate us from others, even within our own faith traditions. We have conservatives and progressives, as we've talked about just a little bit. So I don't, for me, um, doctrine, as, as difficult it might be, and, and it does form identity, it can be a lot more helpful to think about it, um, like I said, for me, when I think about Google Earth, and when you zoom in really close on Google Earth, you can see a street level view and, and you can see um, roads and spaces and ways that we're divided, walls and barriers and divisions and borders. You know, when you look at a map, you see the borders of all these countries. But if you pull Google Earth out and you just see the earth, we don't see the borders and the divisions. And, and if we think of doctrine in that way, you know, it's easy if we pull back a little bit, we, you know, it's easier and clearer to see the picture. So for me, um, understanding doctrine is having humility and, and ultimately God surpasses all understanding and, and understanding that God is at work and that we don't have all of the, you know, all of the answers. And, um, and even as all as, ch you know, uh, children of Abraham, that um, maybe maybe we can think about it like you know we're all singing the same piece of music, but we're singing with different voices. So we have sopranos and altos and bass and 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 so forth. So we're singing different notes and we're singing with different voices, but we're singing the same piece of music for our Creator God. Um, and so that's how I like to think of doctrine. When we zoom in too tight, it becomes divisive. And if, and if we can zoom out a little bit, we can find ways to um, unify. So um, I find, um, I hope this isn't sacrilegious, but I, I find the uh, most boring part of the Catholic mass to be the weekly recitation of the Nicene Creed, what we, we hold in common. I, do Lutherans do that as well? We do, especially during this, you know, uh, high holy season. Yeah. Yeah, and and I, it's the it's the time that, that I fidget the most during the mass because it's like, how many times am I going to repeat these words? But I know the history, and that that creed was adopted in the four hundreds because there was so much fighting. Exactly what you were saying: who was going to get pushed off the roof for not believing this or that? And so they agreed on this one set of doctrine beliefs, and we have to repeat it every week. I see Father Bill is nodding. Um, <laughs> Has anyone ever said that to you before the creed is boring? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Except when it's sung. When it's, I've, I've heard it's sung and it's quite beautiful. But anyway, let's get some comments maybe from our Muslim or Jewish friends about doctrine, your core beliefs. Anybody? Go ahead, Dave. So, so my, my reaction to, to doctrine is, is kind of a practical one. Uh, I, I look at the idea of faith and spirituality as, as something that's uh, complicated and, and difficult and time consuming. And, and I think the, the, the doctrine to me doesn't help me move forward in a relationship with, with God. It, it, it just adds complexity and it, it causes me to use time in a, in a way that's difficult. So I'm one of the ones who doesn't spend much time with it. I would rather invest my time in something that I feel uh, moves me forward with my faith and my uh, spirituality. I misspoke before. Uh, scripture actually rated quite high. 72% of our respondents found scripture very important. I don't know, Gene, if you want to, or anybody wants to talk about scripture, which is different from doctrine. Doctrine are the core beliefs. Scripture are our core um, teachings through the documents that we hold sacred. You, want, you, want to the, you think the argument might be that doctrine is a reflection of scripture. And of course, as we say, authentic or sound doctrine would, would definitely um, be a, a true reflection of what scripture teaches. There would be that argument. No, the, the, Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just the note. The the scripture uh, 
you know, of course, you know, there are, there are like, you know, like we, we call like Bible belt kind of, you know, the, the reading of the scriptures, uh, which sometimes, you know, has, uh, has supported, you know, what, what we, we might call not the best kind of behavior towards the neighbor, <laughs> you know, uh, I think the, uh, uh, you know, there's fundamentalist mm -hmm. and then, uh, you know, then there's, you know, the, the, the a deeper understanding as, you know, a systematic study of the scriptures and in, in terms of, of where they come from and the language of the scriptures and, and, and how it, you know, the translations and, you know, it's, it, it gets kind of, you know, advanced there, but the, 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 basic scriptures uh, that you, people have to understand that, that we, we the, the scripture itself, which is a translation of translations, what you're, what you're going to be reading, you know, is an insp the inspired word of God uh, and that we, we need to uh, have a, the humility to understand it. But uh, you know, there's, you know, not the literal interpretation sometimes because I mean there's so much violence and other things and condemnations and uh, that that can also be found there. But we've got to understand that what you know what was the the historic you know uh, meaning of that particular passage of that particular book. So uh, I'm going to throw a question at our Jewish and and uh, Muslim brothers because the the scripture is central. Um, I have to say, uh, David and Bacheva, when we went, when I went to the um, uh, synagogue service, Shabbat, I, I had a tear in my eye at the end or at that point where they carried the Torah around and people touched it with the tassels. It was very powerful. And the elevation of scripture is so central. And I know it is for Muslims. You want to weigh in, anybody on that? I can't think? speak every word, uh, but the, the scripture is how important it is in our uh, religion. Uh, Certainly, uh, um, uh, you know, scripture is, is way into in our lives. Uh, um, all the rules and, and the way things are, are explained in there. Um, as, for, as for the doctrines that you just mentioned, um, also it comes from the Quran. Uh, uh, the, there are six articles of our faith system of Islam. Um, there's believing in God. There's only one and unique God. And, uh, nobody else uh, in believing in angels, believing the, the the books that are you know, belong to the Torah and the, and the Bible and also uh, the the Quran. Right, we we, we believe on all those three um, in the original forms. Uh, we also uh, believe in uh, prophets uh, as, uh, as as they come in. Maybe the, the numbers are as high as two hundred twenty four thousand, uh, as it's as written in in places. Uh, so God never left the world without any prophets. So we believe in that. Believe in the, we believe in the day of judgment. And we also believe in the doom day and divine decree. So those are the six articles uh, uh, of, of the, the Islamic faith as a doctrine. And, and the Quran and the Torah, are, what parts of the Torah are, are in the Quran? Well, you know, Parts of the stories told in Quran are also can be traced to Torah <clears throat> as well as in Bible. Okay. Uh, so we, we believe in those uh, authenticity of, of all those three books that came to the prophets, one to the Moses, one to the Jesus, and one to the prophet Muhammad. So we believe in all those. And we, we cannot even regard it as a Muslim if you don't believe any of those. So that's, that's just important doctrine in our religion. So, so the familiar stories of the Exodus. Do you go as far as the Exodus? Uh, and uh, I'm not sure what the, what you mean by the Exodus, but like I, I'm not sure the stupid part of the Exodus what it says. But there are stories, many stories of Moses in Quran. Uh, Moses, yeah. Yes, yeah. And, and and Jacob, uh, many stories of Jacob in Quran. Okay. And there is a whole chapter called Mary. Uh, in Quran that talks about the Jesus and, and his yes. relationship with, uh, with his mom. It's important chapters and stories that are included in, all, in, in three books that we believe in. Yes, I was shocked to learn as we came together early on in Abraham's table that there's more on Mary in the Quran than there is in the uh, Christian uh, Gospels. 
That's right. Did it look like you wanted to weigh in on, on scripture? Myself? Yeah. Yeah. So we, we, of course, we believe in the five books and we read the five books through the year, starting uh, at the fall festivals and ending at the fall festival. Um, we read the prophets and the rest of the books. So we have three books. We call them the Torah, the prophets, and the rest of the writings. And we use the three books in our readings, our weekly readings. Uh, the, the Talmud and the rest of the doctrines are, get studied uh, separately with uh, you know, people that are studied separately. But the three books are read in the synagogue for the entire year, the whole cycle. I love so, also in the liturgy how you had people from the congregation come up and read. The rabbi yes. doesn't read the entire, uh, the rabbi yeah. kind of sat on the side and the congregation, the congregants came up and read the sections of the Torah that day. It was very beautiful. Yes. So uh, the, the barb or the bat mitzvah, the young children read mm -hmm. their portions as they learn. Some read more, some read less. <laughs> they read from the prophets. Uh, and the rest of it is always read by the congregation unless the cantor has to fill in. We always Good. have both of them. Just a reminder to our audience, you can pop questions into the chat and we'll take them up. So uh, they'll be... Uh, emailed over to me, texted over to me. Anybody else want to weigh in on scripture, our panelists? Okay, let's let's move then into some areas of more personal um, belief. Um, again, going back to, um, you know, what our, what our survey respondents said, um, I'm going to go to you, David, because um, you want to speak about gratitude. And um, why, why don't you do that? And I'm going to raise a question about what our respondents said. Go ahead on the importance of thanking God for what we have. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll be talking about faith and, and gratitude. And uh, for me, uh, it's going to be a, a quite a personal a set of comments about my experiences uh, more recently. So my faith and my feeling of gratitude have grown over recent years because of books that I've read and, and lectures that I've attended. And I'd like to talk about three of these in particular that have had a, a strong influence on me. So the first one is a, a book by a famous rabbi, Abraham Joshua Heschel. He, he wrote a book called Man is Not Alone. And, I, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, the second one is a little different. Uh, I took a, a, a web-based course given by Yale University in six sessions, and it was about happiness. And I listened carefully, and I, and I found that there was a, a great deal of overlap in this intellectual class uh, to the things I was thinking and learning about in my, in my faith and my spirituality. And the, the third subject is, uh, has to do with, with a Musar course. Musar is a thousand year old Jewish teaching that uh, goes through cycles of popularity and, and, and not so much. But I took a, an eight part class on holiness. So these three elements influenced me and, and had a, uh, a, a strong effect on in, increasing my faith and making me feel more grateful. So I'll talk first about the Heschel book. The Heschel book basically is about how a person can develop a personal relationship with God. Uh, mostly the time is spent not talking about uh, liturgy or praying, but one-on-one, uh, -on -one, what you can do to feel closer to God. And uh, the author, Heschel, spends more than 50 pages over and over in seven different ways saying that God is ineffable, meaning cannot be understood. So he, he felt, Heschel felt that was really important. So uh, 
I thought a lot about it and it made a lot of sense to me. And that probably moved my thinking that uh, God cannot be understood. So Heschel writes that, that a person can achieve a close relationship with God by having faith that all outcomes, and these are Heschel's words, all outcomes, both good and bad, have a purpose to God. And since many times a human being cannot understand the purpose, our faith can and should allow us to accept God's will and God's purpose, which we don't understand. That had a, a strong effect on me. He, he further recommends that if you want to improve your relationship with God, prayer is very important. Gratitude in a lot of different ways. And so that's the, the point that I'm, I'm emphasizing. So Heschel felt gratitude was very important and building relationships. And, and that's something that I found in other sources as well. Building relationships is really important to spirituality and a relationship with God. And the, the last point that I'll remember is uh, Heschel recommended strongly that we all work on, on doing holy work, however we understand that. So uh, I'll say in recent times, I, I've uh, accepted Heschel's premise and the result has been my faith and my gratitude have grown as a consequence of accepting uh, those ideas. So the second idea, the Yale course on happiness taught that many of the common beliefs about happiness really don't stand up to scrutiny and analysis. Typically, people think that money, material possessions, career success, as an example, really are the, the, the way to find happiness. But the uh, research says these don't stand up. They're not sustainable. We get used to whatever wealth, whatever career success, we get used to it quickly. And that's not a good, uh, a good source of happiness. So this professor taught that the, the path to happiness involves gratitude. The simple idea of being grateful for what we have is very powerful for our feeling of well-being. The, the second idea, and this now crosses over to Heschel's work as well, building relationships is a, is a key point the Yale University taught that people who have genuine relationships with other people just have a more positive outlook and, and tend to be happier. And the last point that I remember that became very important is uh, the Yale University taught that doing meaningful work, maybe mm -hmm. what Heschel described as holy work, are very important for happiness. So the third component that, that I'm thinking about relating to gratitude is this uh, Musa course. This was an eight part course on Jewish holiness. And they put an emphasis on soul traits. We all have soul traits. Typical examples are gratitude, humility, faith, loving kindness, generosity, and, and probably dozens of others. So we have soul traits that describe us in our personalities and and many of us do not have them in balance and so the the, uh, the course goes on to to show balance means not too much humility not too little humility not too much gratitude not too little gratitude and i found that uh, very powerful uh, to look at the world in, in, in regard to soul traits and achieving a balance. So the other components that overlap my other points, the, uh, the course on holiness, there you go. We, we, we broke the... <laughs> so today's my anniversary. We're getting calls all day. Well, you should be grateful for that. Yeah, I am. <laughs> Right, we've been married a long time. 
Right. So, let, so let's go back. So there, there were overlaps in all the thinking, these three different ideas, building relationships. And in this case, the Musa work like, approached relationships in a different way. They, they talked about a relationship with yourself, understanding and respecting and, uh, and, ha and having respect for yourself. That was important. And then it went on to say, with that solid foundation, it's really important to have positive relationships with other people and the people around you, people everywhere. And the, uh, the idea was those components uh, enhance the progress that you make uh, in your relationship to God. And the point that was, that was raised in this course that um, was profound to me is that holiness is achieved as a journey, it's a process, and it, it doesn't just happen. You make progress toward holiness, and no one can be uh, as holy as God. And I remember they spoke about uh, the, the Bible, the Torah says, uh, God speaks and says, I am holy, therefore you should be holy. So that made an impression on me. So those were the three elements that had an effect on me which make me grateful and i'm grateful for the jewish values that i've learned in particular that we were all created in the image of god and that's a, a complicated concept that can be understood by everyone in slightly different ways and the other jewish value that's important to me is called tikkun olam and it has the idea of doing good work and healing the world. So in summary, these values and, and these, these learnings and studies have, have helped me advance my relationship with God and increase my happiness. And I'm hoping moving me forward on, uh, on my path to holiness. So I, I'd like to conclude with a, a, a prayer of gratitude that I say every day, not in temple, but at home. Uh, and and uh, I usually do it looking out the window at nature. And I say, blessed are you, O Lord, my God, King of the universe, who gave me life, who sustained me, and who brought me to this day. Amen, I say. Thank Amen. you. So uh, for our panelists and our audience uh, today, you know, every Sunday Newsday has three uh, people of faith speaking. Today it's about what is their spiritual, the source of their spirituality. And Rabbi Lena Zeberini um, has a, her column is basically on gratitude and the prayers of gratitude that she recites every day. It's very beautiful. Let's get some other, other I saw Jean nodding a lot. You want to weigh in on gratitude? Yeah, I think that our survey, you know, really backs up everything that David said, that, you know, from gratitude, it spills into wanting to be connected with, uh, you know, a larger purpose and to be serving others and serving our neighbor. And, you know, to serve our neighbor, we have to know our neighbor, I think. Uh, but I think our, our, our survey really reflects a lot of what David had to say. So, so one of the puzzles for me was um, the significant number of people um, who didn't really think that God had um, intervened in their lives. Only 37% of our respondents said they think that God, if they pray to God, that you know, they will get some assistance with a disease or some change in events. Um, but 69% or 64% said that they were thankful for um, what God does for them. So I think, Sandra, you wanted to talk about um, God's intervention. And um, there's a little contradiction here. And, terms of what are big time yes uh, um i mean i i i will speak of course from the muslims perspective um and i'm sure there'll be some uh, some contradictions uh, um that people might uh, might say um from the uh, there's a verse in quran that says uh, that the god says i am as close to you as your heart so we can understand this that that god is with us at all times uh, as, as close as our hearts so we believe that in our daily lives, we all have responsibilities toward God in whatever we're doing. Um, 
he hears and sees everything we do and therefore we have to be conscious of this reality and do our actions accordingly. <clears throat> Whatever good or bad comes up uh, on you is a result of your actions. This is another uh, uh, verse. In a larger scale, this is a, of, of course, this is considered as a warning to humanity to observe the natural laws uh, and protect the environment as well. Uh, nothing we in Muslims believe that nothing in the universe is a coincidence. At the end, we harvest uh, what we well, we harvest what we see. Uh, that's an important word. In um, world is a testing ground for humanity to do their best and be wise to follow God's path to help yourself, your neighbors, your relatives, and anyone in need, and also be kind and humble while doing so. So if you have a health, if you are a healthy person, you have an obligation to give a hand to a sick person, you know, to uplift his or her spirit, or you know, if you are a materially rich person, you have an obligation to help the needy, give a portion of your wealth to reduce hunger and suffrage, and the list might go on and on. On the suffrage in the natural disasters, so there's another subject that came up, uh, if you remember on the uh, discussions we had uh, internally. Um, uh, so in a good day or bad day, um, on individual level, uh, God tells how resolute you are uh, in a good day or bad day. He wants you to turn to him, remember him and take refuge in him. No giving up on him to the personal calamity. So remember, this is your test. You will be rewarded for this if you stay with him with patience. As you suffer, you realize your own weaknesses and dependence to God. Think of it as you collect reward, reward points as you suffer that has a capacity to work many times more on the day of judgment and the hereafter. On a larger scale disasters and suffrage, that's, uh, that's another question that came on. Um, you know, sometimes the relatively small disasters might prevent a much larger calamity. So we take this as a warning sign and try correcting what's wrong in personal and societal level. Whatever the scale of the disaster is, um, many people might be suffering or even losing their lives, even the children. No discrimination. That that's, uh, seems very odd to a lot of people. On this subject, Prophet Muhammad uh, brings an explanation, says that yes, they all suffer and even uh, lose their lives. However, the good people will be rewarded accordingly in hereafter. If they lost their belongings and the wealth, those will be considered as charity. So that discrimination uh, in the world is not there, but certainly rewards are, are 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 for the for the hereafter. On the other side of the coin, in any disasters, for others who were not affected are urged to help to heal the suffrage, wherever the disasters happen to be. This is also considered your test to measure whether you use your will and conscience righteously. As I said before, the world is a testing ground for humanity. If the calamities were happening only to the bad people or, un, 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 or to the unbelievers, then the notion of test will disappear. Everybody will, everyone will be good and a good believer. But that's not uh, the way that God put us for uh, testing. God granted everyone a will and a conscience, and he wants uh, everyone to use it wisely. So this is the summary of how we look at disasters and interference in our lives by God. So we, I, I'd like the panel to, uh, uh, I thank you for that, Sadri. Uh, I'd like the panel to um, sort of deal with what appears to be this contradiction that our respondents um, kind of reflected what we were just talking about as a group um, in preparation for this program of the so-called God is dead movement of the 60s, uh, where people, including myself, uh, looked at the Holocaust, I remember as a kid, and thinking if a God allowed all of those faithful Jews who pray to him to uh, die, then how could we believe that God intervenes in our lives? And there seems to be a touch of that in our respondents, in that so few said, I pray for God to intervene. And yet they, they're grateful for the support that God gives them. What's, what kind of support? If God doesn't save us from the Holocaust, what support does God give to us? I think Dave touched on some of this, but 
asking our panel, anybody on that question. Uh, I, I'll just, I just repeat where, where I, now this is my personal uh, uh, journey. I latched on to this concept after 50 pages of very dense copy that God cannot be understood. And, and it's a matter of faith whether you want to believe that everything that goes on in this world has a purpose. And, and you know, in the book that he, he wrote about circumstances that on initial encounter seem to be very negative, and then down the road a piece, they cause things to happen that turned out to be positive. So if we have the faith, that either we're being tested, I guess that may have been Sajri's comments, we're being tested, or we need to maintain our faith that we cannot understand what God is doing, but everything has a purpose. So I have to tell you that when I crossed that bridge to uh, accepting that premise, it was, it was actually quite a bit a relief that, that I had a feeling of comfort knowing that I can't explain the question, I can't explain, no one can explain the Holocaust uh, in the same breath as God, but it's a matter of faith. Anybody else? What, what does God provide us if he does not, or she, I should say, intervene and save us from cancer or save us from the Holocaust? And what, what does God offer us? Bacheva? God offers us many different things, but we don't understand him. Uh, for us who believe he's there in the form of nature, or in the form of a beautiful statue of Mary, God is there with us. Uh, there are no explanations for how things work. Personally, I can offer many, many personal stories and events that we do not understand, that substantiate the fact that we can be told to do all the righteous things and things will come our way. As maybe some of you know, know my personal story or not do it and it will come anyway. We don't know which way to follow. But the fact that for me, I was told to follow and I followed blindly basically and i got gifts from god uh gifts by Gemma. i'm sorry what kind of gifts my children <laughs> that's a gift for our, sure our children mm -hmm. so yes believing or having faith or waiting for a note from from above it's all within your personal journey so i've always been puzzled uh, uh, i i love the psalms for their poetic beauty but so often the psalms will say things like you know if you cross the barren desert i will save you and and i'm thinking that doesn't really happen it's very rare so um well go ahead. Apropos, go, apropos yeah. No, I'm saying apropos to the barren desert, they crossed the barren desert and they arrived to the Holy Land. If you this particular psalm, right. but if you think in your heart to do a certain mission or a certain way, if you follow what's in your heart, uh, and you have a conversation, like David said, a personal conversation. It might come true, but it might not. And you can't be unhappy. You can't be mad because he's not doing it to you. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's personal. But yes, we look at the Holocaust or we look at other travesties that are done all over the world. And you say, why God? It's all in the book of Job, isn't it? About the suffering of a person and where is God when I need him? Right. Father Bill, go ahead. Well, <clears throat> well first of all, Prayer is not meant to change God. Prayer is meant to change us. You know, at least you know, from my you know perspective, that we don't we don't have to convince God to love us or to save us. 
God loves us. Okay. Uh, but at the same time, and, and how do you cure cancer? Well, God created people with intelligence who, who will, will have the spirit and use to focus their intelligence on, on curing cancer, you know, or whatever. But also on the, the, the obverse of that, of course, is that, is that people use their gifts to do horrible things in the world. Yeah. Uh, and simultaneously, of course, and, you know, as, you know, we grieve for the people of Kentucky who are facing the, uh, yeah. you know, the incredible storms that they just had to go through. Uh, and, and what's the meaning of, all, you know, how does all this fit together? You know, um, I think the, uh, the main thing of, of prayer is to, uh, is to align our, our, our minds, our, our psyches, our, our own, the rhythms of our lives with, with what we understand is God's plan through, you know, through scripture and, and tradition. Uh, but at the same time uh, that, that we, we uh, and, and, and I believe in miracles, <laughs> you know, uh, but it's not, you know, God does the miracles, not necessarily because I asked for them, you know. Uh, so I, I don't know. I mean, this, this, this to live with, with contradictions is, is, is part of living, in, you know, human life. Uh, but I think the uh, prayer, you know, fervent prayer in gratitude and all is, for, you know, for the gift of life. And we pray that we we will be able to participate in those people who are trying to make the world better and, and to make, and to, to, uh, uh, you know, be, be, you know, care for the most vulnerable, uh, and, and which is a, a very difficult task. And rated very high. We'll be talking about that, uh, before yeah. we conclude about how our respondents rated that very high. So let me ask the, the panel. So, this morning, um, they had the mayor of one of those towns that was destroyed. I, I, if you've seen the images, it's like an atomic bomb went off. I mean, the buildings are not standing. And she said that most of the churches are damaged. And they were all going to hold services this morning. They were definitely going to go ahead and hold services. And some of them had no roofs. They, she said one, the only thing left was the altar. And they were one of the churches. But they were definitely going to... the the, the priests and the ministers and the rabbis were going to have their service, well, I guess the priests and ministers this morning, are going to have their services. What would people be, those people who went to the service, what, what would be in their heads? What would they be saying to God at a time like this? Mm-hmm. And I'm sure they went. I'm sure they went. Yeah, and this is the uh, the age old question, right? Uh, Rabbi Kushner's book. Why do uh, you know bad things happen to good people? You know, I don't think that's from the eighties or or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's really it's a theo- It's what is your theology of suffering? And I think all of our faith traditions here kind of come at this from a little bit different um, space. Uh, you know, I don't think there's necessarily any consensus that we would find on this topic, but I think. It's, it's finding language around um, God loving us, really, ultimately. Yeah, I was just going to say that. And Viktor Frankl, in his book, uh, Man's Search for Meaning, talks about the people who survived in the camps, who had this sense that God was present through his love, and that they would then, they would live out that love by helping however they could, the people around them. And, and that, um, That's it. That's the punchline. People yeah. around them in community. Yeah. That's yeah. why they went to church this morning because yeah. they were together in community. Yeah, Amen. I would think so. I would think so. I, I I often think of the you know those horrible moments as people were en- entering the death chambers, and I'm sure there were people taking the hands of others and comforting others, and 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 that's that's the presence, that's the support, that's the the love. What you said, the love. So so um our our. Pat, our uh, folks were so high on this idea of getting out of yourself, of doing for others. Um, I just want to give you the numbers. Um, 74% said it was most important that, that um, they feel part of something that they rated most important as feeling part of something bigger than themselves and having a sense of purpose and meaning. 
And then when asked what that meant, they said helping other vulnerable people, working for justice and peace. So um, Taha, you were gonna talk about this, this idea of purpose um, from a Muslim perspective, but I think we're all gonna agree with you. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah. So why uh, I think that you know purpose is very important. Um, if we were to, let's say, you know, uh, look at the other side of the spectrum and just um, think in an, like an atheist point of view, if you were to just, you know, reject religion, what would be the purpose of life? Now, scientifically, you'll just say, all right, so I'm a human and, you know, you get born and you replicate, you know, you have children and then your children have children. And that just becomes the point of life. It's sort of feels kind of meaning, meaningless and it doesn't feel very much fulfilling. But, you know, when you add God into the equation, religion, and, you know, personally for me, you know, uh, I'm a Muslim, uh, you know, it's, it becomes a whole lot more fulfilling because uh, as, you know, we spoke before, um, you know, there, there is bad times that happen in our lives and we have to understand that, you know, the pain that comes to us, uh, it's only possible uh, with happiness. You know, if, if there's pain coming, there's happiness coming and they only work together because you can't have one without the other. And so, when this pain does come to us, we can turn to God and we can have a, a fulfilling experience even through the pain because both pain and happiness are inevitable, but suffering or being fulfilled by it uh, is our choice. And if we don't have a purpose and meaning in life, then when that pain does come, uh, we might you know, fall into depression, fall into doing, having bad habits, doing bad things that usually you know, our religion prohibits. And just, you know, ruining our lives. But if we do have that sense of purpose, you know, we research into our religion, uh, then we would be, able, would be able to avoid those things. Because when the pain does come, we'd know how to at least be fulfilled by it, by praying to God and understanding, you know, um, our purpose here on the planet. And yeah, I think that's why the sense of purpose is so uh, integral for a person. And uh, overall, uh, what, what is the sense of purpose you, you draw from your Muslim religion in, in Briefly, what would it be? I'm sorry, I kind of got caught. What would your own sense of purpose be that you get from the Muslim faith? Yeah, so our our purpose here being that it's it's a test, and you know I usually hate using the word test because it kind of throws some some people off. But if you think about it, you know um, life is a challenge, and whenever you, like you set a goal for yourself, um, the the part that's the journey of getting to the goal is usually a whole lot more fulfilling and it feels a whole lot better than when you get to the goal. And, you know, the purpose in, in Islam of what the purpose of life is and what's our purpose here is that it is a test, you know, uh, like an analogy I can give is something like um, a teacher in a school where you have like student A and student B and the teacher says, oh, student B, I already know that you're going to fail the class. So without even taking the exam uh, or taking the course, I'm just going to fail you. you. You'll have to go take the class again. And then student A, I know you're going to pass, so you'll be fine. You can just go through at the beginning of the semester. Now, both, both of these kids are going to be like, oh, this, is, this makes no sense. What do you mean? This is unfair. And let's say that they do take the course and then student B does fail and student A uh, passes. Student B is going to complain saying, I only failed because you said I would. You, didn't, uh, you, know, you just had that knowledge, so that's why I failed. And we can incorporate this to God and our relationship with him here on earth, uh, you know, this life is a test. And if uh, what, are, are you, in what way are you being tested? What, how does, yeah. what does that mean? In, in yeah, so I'm going to get, so like if the exam, that course that you're taking in school where your teacher just said, oh, you know, you're going to fail. It's like God saying, oh, you know, you're going to go to hell or heaven. And that's like the passing or the failing. It's, uh, you know, either eternal peace and happiness in heaven or, you know, the bad things that, come with uh, and help and so you want to work towards what you can do and be a, become a more fulfilling and better person by uh, either getting to heaven or getting to hell you want to have that ability that free will to even take that test and because of that that's what makes it so fulfilling and that's what gives you that purpose in life that i'm going to work towards uh doing this like in our personally in our uh, religion it's praying five times a day and you know uh fasting and all this uh sort of stuff that we have is what is our like objective that's on a daily basis and not just, you know, uh, something that's easy to do. I'd like to put everybody on the spot and I'll put myself on the spot first, but what, what, 
sense of purpose do you get um, to get out of yourself that makes you a person of faith? For me, um, it's kind of what you're saying. I, uh, it's, a, um, it's a sense of, um, you know, I'm part of a bigger picture. It's not all about me, life. And, uh, and it's particularly, uh, it's an ethical framework that makes sense of right and wrong. This is what my faith does for me. And so I can translate that into my life as a teacher. Uh, when I was a teacher, I, I'm now a public policy advocate. And so I frame everything in terms of, you know, what's right and what's wrong. And the bottom line that I get from my faith is um, the sense that uh, I am called to help people who need help. I'm called to, to um, for us Christians, is the Matthew 25, you know, whatever you did for the least of my brothers and sisters, you did for me. So, so that's the sense of purpose I get. And it filters everything, or it's not always, I have to say, that's the sin part, but it, you know, that's what I try to do. So who wants to go next? What's the sense of purpose you get from your, go ahead, Dave. So I, I look back to the comments that I, that I made earlier, and, and it has to do with, my, my faith is integral to me doing holy work. And, and holy work can be interpreted in a, in a lot of ways, but holy work involves other people. It involves helping. It involves improving things. So that's all wrapped up in, in one spiritual brew. Acheva? Well, we have a saying, uh, one of our sages said the following, the world stands on three pillars, Torah, the scriptures, Avodah, which means worship and work. Avodah means work, but work the work, the, world, the Lord's way. And Gemilut Chasadim, uh, works of kindness mm -hmm. and help the others. Mm -hmm. So this has been my three columns and hopefully everyone's uh, three columns. And when I get up in the morning and I know that I go to the Y or to the temple, I'm going to interact with children, with families, with adults, with seniors, and just be myself and share the beauty of the world and share our tradition, whether the Christians or Muslim tradition, whatever good work we do, like we, some work we do together, Richard and, and myself, it makes me feel fulfilled. Mm -hmm. Makes me feel part of the community. The work we're doing now, right? We're bringing together the eighth graders to tell their immigrant stories, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jewish and, and Christian and, and Muslim eighth graders. Wonderful, yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's go to our Christian friends. Jean, what, what's that sense of purpose you get? That, um, well, instead of three pillars, I would call them three cups of tea, which would be serving neighbors, um, practicing hospitality, and being a peacemaker. And for me, that translates into um, work at, in Down in Wyandanche at uh, Trinity Lutheran, serving uh, the homeless, uh, food, and, and other acts uh, like that in the community. Sadri? I guess uh, uh, our belief is more of the like hereafter centered. Uh, so whatever uh, makes us to get there as a, a, a you know as a as a believer, anyone who believes in in in, in God and there's only one God has a space in, in in heaven. That that's what we're taught. That's for sure. But how you get there and how long you have to wait before you get there is the is the is the dilemma that we don't know. Uh, so do good for you, for, for your family, for your friends, uh, uh, and do your daily prayers. Um, visit, uh, visit, uh, um, sick people, help them out, uh, go in the disaster area, and give a lot of charity if you can afford. So those are the uh, life's purpose. Uh, so we hope, we hope that will be, will be in the, we have an easy pass lane, uh, ticket to the, to the heaven. That, that's, that's the life purpose. Mm hmm. Ninety two percent of our respondents said um, they're very important to help help people in need. Ninety two percent, almost the entire group. Father Bill, all those years That's, of being a priest, still a priest. What's that <coughs> sense of purpose? purpose. Well, <clears throat> maybe I th in terms of the, uh, you know, of the 
the time of Advent where we are now, you know, and uh, in terms of the, you know, the said the coming of God, you know, to the world, you know, the the the, the, the solidarity of of God with creation, you know, by God's design, um, and you know, in so many, you know, in different with a different language from the, our three traditions. Um, but I'd say one of the things that, uh, you know, my reflection for, you know, for this particular Sunday was, you know, the, uh, uh, the word that the, you know, this, the, the, uh, the Lord will, will be with you. You know, you will, will see, you will see God. Uh, and, and you say, well, how will I, where will I see God? You know, and Jesus right. teaches us in the least among us. I mean, as as as, as Dick referenced before, uh, you know, in the from the Gospel of Matthew, uh, that you know, to, to find the people, you know, and I think I, I picture, of course, the the people suffering desperately from the, uh, you know, from these uh, storms recently. I think of the people, you know, struggling to find refuge and in, in, you know having to flee countries and. And being rejected by borders from borders, including our own, um, I think the uh, the need to to see that, that this is this is God speaking to us, you know that's that's the purpose. I think you know in all of this coming together, where the transcendent, you know, where the rubber hits the road, you know, <laughs> the transcendent becomes real in this moment of, of the chronology in this particular life. That child this uh you know this this refugee you know trying to 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 uh to find refuge in in a in a safe place uh that we and that the, the world we have to unite to to you know through our religious systems and and motivations to to find a space to be able to help resolve that that's the uh that's what i get out of this yeah, I, I, I'll conclude with this. Um, I, I, I've always felt that Matthew 25 was sort of like the opening of our Declaration of Independence. It's, it sets, you know, sets the goalpost, the North Star. Whatever you do for the least of my brothers and sisters, you do for me. Uh, and and um, and that is um, that is the sense of purpose. Um, so uh, to our audience, uh, if you want to see the uh, full um, survey. It just it's on the message that came with the flyer. You can just click and see the survey of results. Um, and our next program is going to be January 16th, the Sunday of Martin Luther King weekend. And it will be on what Martin Luther King, how Martin Luther King speaks to your faith tradition. So we're in the process of planning that. Um, I want to thank our panelists. You guys did a Richard, great job. Richard, Richard, yes. we had no questions from our audience. We did not, no. Yeah. Okay. I just yeah. want to say something jokingly before yeah. you conclude. So one of the rabbis called me and asked me to do another favor for the community. And jokingly, I answered him, I can't do another good deed because in the entryway to the pearly gates, they will say too many good deeds. You can't <laughs> enter. <laughs> so this is just a little joke. I, I'll do my best to continue. Well, this was a great conversation about what, what uh, in a secular society like ours, what keeps us in the faith tradition. I'll end with a little story, too, about my Christmas tree. So um, my daughter was raised Catholic, and um, my grandchildren are now being raised nuns by nuns, and not the N-U-Ns, but nuns. Mm -hmm. And uh, she went through a whole process of uh, saying to me, Dad, the, the, it's not going to be Catholicism. It's too patriarchal. And she called an Episcopal church and asked the woman, answered the phone. She said, can I speak to the pastor? And the woman said, I am the pastor. And I thought, oh, good. She's going to become Episcopalian. And then she said, no, I can't. In fact, she said the Abrahamic religions are too patriarchal. So she wound up having the kids in a Baha'i uh, religious instruction. And they're basically nuns now because, you know, with, with kids, it's soccer games and field trips. But we had an incident under the tree, uh, and I'm going to illustrate how deeply this faith runs. Uh, and uh, my grandson was about five, and he was down with the Italian nativity scene. He was a little bored, actually, on Christmas Eve. 
And he took the uh, Christ child and put it on the back of a camel and he was playing with it and making a little caravan. And my daughter, the nun, rushed over and said, you can't do that. In this house, Jesus is respected. <laughs> and I thought, that's interesting. <laughs> so <laughs> under the silly tree, there was some real meaning and uh, it, something is still deep in there. So I want to thank all of you. You guys are terrific. I want to thank our audience. And for our audience, uh, if you are not on our regular mailing list, you can just respond to my email that I sent with the flyer and we'll put you on the mailing list. And everybody, happy Hanukkah, belated, Merry Christmas, happy Kwanzaa, and happy New Year. And may we all be uh, healthy and uh, in good spirits next year. We'll see you next year. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. 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 Actually, we could stay on if you want, just have a...